Good day, students, and welcome to this lesson on group financial reporting. Today, we're going to be looking at the measurement principles at acquisition date, and in particular, we'll be looking at under or overvalued assets of the acquiree at acquisition date. We'll also be looking at the contingent liabilities of the acquiree at the acquisition date. And lastly, we'll also look at the internally generated intangible assets of the acquiree at the date of acquisition. The measurement principle in IFRS 3 says that the acquirer shall measure the identifiable assets acquired and the liabilities assumed at the acquisition date fair values. And we know that fair value is defined in IFRS 13, and in simple terms, it's the market value of the asset or liability. So at the date of acquisition, IFRS 3 requires us to measure all the assets and liabilities of the acquiree at fair value. And this implies that at the date of acquisition, we may need to revalue some of our assets and liabilities to bring them to their fair value. And when we revalue them, those revaluations may also attract the deferred tax depending on the future tax consequences of those assets and liabilities. So if the subsidiary has recognized these assets and liabilities at fair value, then there's no need for us to make any adjustments at acquisition date because those assets and liabilities are already in line with the measurement principle of IFRS 3. However, if some of the subsidiaries' assets and liabilities are not at fair value at acquisition date, then we need to make adjustments uh, to bring those assets and liabilities to their fair values. And like we said in the previous slides, those adjustments may attract deferred tax. Now let's talk about contingent liabilities of the acquiree at the date of acquisition. So there's two types of contingent liabilities in terms of IS-37 and the first one is one where we only have a possible obligation whose existence will be confirmed by the occurrence or non-occurrence of a future uncertain event not wholly within the entity's control. The second type of a contingent liability is where we have a present obligation due to a past event. However, we are not able to recognize that contingent liability because either it is not probable that there will be an outflow of economic resources or we cannot measure the amount reliably. Now, in terms of IS-37, we know that we do not recognize contingent liabilities in the financial statements. We only disclose them in the notes. Now, if risk 3 brings in an exception to that recognition principle where if the subsidiary has got a contingent liability that is a present obligation, in other words, the second type of a contingent liability, then we need to recognize it as part of the business combination and the fair value of that contingent liability. If this 3 says as of the acquisition day, the acquirer shall recognize separately from goodwill the identifiable assets acquired and the liabilities assumed. And that principle implies that as part of the business combination, we need to identify all the assets and liabilities, and that may result in the recognition of assets and liabilities that were not previously recognized in the individual financial statements of the acquiree or the subsidiary. So those may include internally generated brand names, patents, and customer relationships which are ordinarily expensed, but you know, uh, as, as part of the business combination, we are required to then recognize them and measure them separately from goodwill. And we will measure them at their fair value at acquisition date in line with the measurement principle in IFRS 3. Let's look at an example. 
We are told that on the 1st of Jan 2021, Adam Limited acquired control of EVE Limited by acquiring 80% of EVE Limited's share capital for 1,200,000. And the following is a list of the assets and liabilities of EVE at 1 Jan 2021. And we can see we've got a couple of assets and a liability there, and we are given the respective carrying amounts and fair values of those assets and liabilities. Now we can already see that the machinery has got a fair value that is higher than the carrying amount, so we'll need to revalue our machinery as part of the business combination. We'll have to do the same with land, and we can see that vehicles are already at fair value because the carrying amount is the same as the fair value. However, inventory uh, is overvalued because the carrying amount is 50,000, whereas the fair value is 35. So we'll need to write down our inventory to its fair value. And we can see that our trade receivables and trade payables are fairly valued. Then we go to the additional information. And the first thing that we're told is that EVE Limited, which is the subsidiary, had an internally generated trademark, which was not recognized. An independent evaluator provided a fair value of 80,000 for the trademark at the acquisition date. Now, this is an internally generated intangible asset. The expenditure relating to this would have been expensed in the books of uh, EVE, the subsidiary. However, if Restry requires us at acquisition date to recognize this intangible asset at its fair value. So we'll be bringing it in at its fair value of 80,000. And we'll also have to account for deferred tax on this trademark. Then we are also told that at acquisition date, if Limited had a contingent liability that could not be recognized as it was not probable that there would be an outflow of economic resources. The fair value of the contingent liability we are told is 60,000 and SARS does not allow any tax deductions on this liability. So once again, this contingent liability would not have been recognized in the individual financial statements of the subsidiary EVE. However, if risk three requires us to measure and recognize it at its fair value at acquisition date and we'll be bringing it in at 60,000. And because there are no tax deductions on this, we're not going to account for any deferred tax. And we are also told that the tax rate is 28% and capital gains are included at a rate of 80%. And we are required to calculate the goodwill or gain on bargain purchase at 1 January 2021. To calculate our goodwill or gain on bargain purchase, we'll apply this formula in IFRS 3 where we first look at the consideration transferred and we are given that consideration. Then we add the NCI at acquisition. In this instance, we were not told that the NCIs are measured at fair value. So we'll assume that they are measured at the proportionate share of the net asset at acquisition date. And we subtract the fair value of the identifiable net assets acquired. And this we will need to calculate based on those assets and liabilities that we are given. The end result would, will give us either a goodwill or gain on bargain purchase. And if it's a goodwill, then we know that it will be recognized in the statement of financial position as a non-current asset. And if we end up with a gain on bargain purchase, then we need to recognize it in the statement of profit and loss as part of our other income. And obviously, if this relates to a business combination that occurred in the previous years, then we'll need to include that gain on bargain purchase as part of the opening balance of retained earnings. Now, going back to the assets and liabilities of the subsidiary and acquisition date, we can see that we've got this machinery which was undervalued by 200,000. So we will increase our net asset value by 200,000 and account for deferred tax at 28%, which is 56,000. Then we look at the land, it's got a carrying amount of 300,000, but the fair value is 750,000. So we must bring in a revaluation of 450. 
and that revaluation will attract deferred tax at the CGT rate, which is 100,800. There's no adjustments to vehicles, but uh, we can see that our inventory needs to be written down by 15,000, and that will also attract deferred tax at 28% which is a deferred tax asset of 4,200. There's no adjustments to trade receivables and there's no adjustment to trade payables. But we know from the additional information that there's a trademark that is internally generated that must be recognized. So it's carrying amounts in the books of the subsidiary zero. However, from a group perspective, we need to bring it in at 80,000. So that creates a difference of 80,000 and you must account for the deferred tax at 28%, which is 22,400. We also know that we've got that contingent liability that must be brought in at 60,000. However, there's no tax deductions on this, so there will not be any deferred tax implications. So the end result is that our the fair value of our net assets uh, is 1,550,000 less the deferred tax implications of the revaluations that we made, giving us a net identifiable asset of 1,375,000 at the date of acquisition. We can then calculate our goodwill or gain on bargain purchase starting with the consideration transferred of 1,200,000 then adding our NCIs at their proportionate share so we're just applying 20% to our fair value of the net identifiable assets and then we subtract the fair value of the net identifiable assets to get our goodwill amount of 100,000 Now, in summary, we have learned in this lesson that under or overvalued assets of the subsidiary at acquisition date must be revalued to their fair value. We've also learned that any contingent liabilities in the subsidiary or the acquiree must be recognized at the date of acquisition at their fair value if they are a present obligation. And we've also learned that internally generated intangible assets of the subsidiary must be recognized at fair value as part of the business combination and all of these adjustments may attract deferred tax depending on the future tax consequences of those adjustments. That is the end of our lesson. I hope you have learned how to apply the measurement principle of E3 and I wish you well with your studies. Thank you.